So we have our second novel today. Uh, so we have two novels, two books of poetry, and two books of nonfiction. Our novel, Letters from Johnny by Sorry, Wayne Ng, I mean, uh, oh, has actually, we've got Wayne on CBC Radio uh, yesterday, so I will share a link for that as well. He had a fantastic interview. Wayne Ng was born in downtown Toronto to Chinese immigrants who fed him a steady diet of bitter melons and kung fu movies. Ng works as a school social worker in Ottawa, but lives to write, travel, eat, and play, preferably all at the same time. His debut novel, Finding the Way, a novel of Lao Tzu, excuse me, a novel of Lao Tzu was released in 2018. He is an award-winning short story writer and travel writer who continues to push his boundaries from the Arctic to the Antarctic, blogging and photographing along the way at wayneingwrites.com. And I will put that in the chat as well. Welcome, Wayne. Thanks, Margo. Are we good? We are good. Excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, launch day is so huge for us writers. As Connie said, uh, the work into this started a year ago, but as a writer, it started years ago. And I can't tell you how many hours and how much work goes into it. And there's only one name on the cover of the book, but there are so many others who have a hand in this. And, you know, for, for launch day, a lot of writers will use that as an opportunity to talk about their work. But I like to use that as an opportunity to thank people. At the back of the book, there are acknowledgments, and I could easily spend up the next 10 minutes to talk about it all the people who had a hand in this, but I've had so many DMs, um, you know, messages and emails in the last day or two. I'm completely feeling the love. Uh, I'm a bit overwhelmed. I can't get to everybody to thank you for your acknowledgement and for your support, but do know um, I'm really moved by it. So I want to start by also thanking the Gornica team. Firstly, Michael Morola and Connie McFarlane. Their publishers saw something in the story of an 11 year old who couldn't punctuate and spell. You know, so they, they took a bit of a chance. Uh, so I appreciate that. And secondly, I want to thank Margot Lapierre and Dylan Curran, uh, publicists and marketing gurus. Um, they made me look good, or at least they tried. Uh, you know, you can only do so much. So, Letters from Johnny is set in Toronto in 1970 through the eyes of the wily Johnny Wong. He's an 11-year-old boy, son of Chinese immigrant mother. Johnny runs wild around the back alleys and streets of downtown Toronto, stick handling around creepy neighbors, a bully, and other immigrants. He's befriended by one of the draft dodgers, mentors, writing. But his world unravels after a murder, a betrayal, and the threat of the children's aid removing him from his mother. All this as he tries to make sense of a national crisis, the FLQ kidnappings. His only solace are letters, first to a pen pal, then to Dave Keon, because, as captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, he can be trusted. So instead of reading, I thought I'd do one, one better. I'm going to show you the book trailer that I painstakingly slapped together. I shouldn't say slapped together, it cost me a lot of hours, but it's topped off with the narration of one of my students who actually is 11 years old, so I wasn't going to compete with Miles, but um, Margo, are we ready to go? We are, thank you, Wayne. I will share my screen. We've got a fantastic video to share with you. Sorry about that. If I turn it down, it might fuck it up. I don't want to fuck it up. Just let it do what you want. Exactly. Yeah, don't worry about it. If you can. can you cover this? October 19th, 1970. Don't worry about it. Dear Dave Keon, my name is Johnny Wong. I'm in grade 5 and I go to Ord Street Public School. I live on Henry Street. It's near Chinatown in Toronto. My teacher says I have to write a pen pal, so I picked two. 
because the captain of autonomy beliefs you're the only person I can trust. You always play fair and you do your best. If father comes back, well, maybe you two can be friends. I used to have a for real friend named Raleigh. He has a beard and sideburns like his hero Castro. He also thinks Mao is a groovy dude and a friend to people everywhere. Raleigh is a draft dodger from the United States. He wants to run beside us, except he killed our neighbor, Mimi Ming. It was my first time seeing a for real dead body. Now, Raleigh's on the run, but I think he's following me. Everybody's talking about the FLQ. They have bombs and they're kidnapping important people. They want 23 prisoners free or else they will kill one of the prisoners. 23 for one is not a fair trade. Well, unless it's for you. So no way the police are going to go for it. How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Just watch me. My teacher loves Trudeau. Just watch me. She thinks he will save us from the terrorists. Except if he was a for real man, he would not be that hard to beat up. Everybody says bad things about people from Quebec. But you were from there, so I know it's not true. They found one of the FLQ prisoners dead in the back of a car. I saw at the funeral that he had a son named Jean. Now, he doesn't have a father like me. That made me feel, well, very sad. I will write to Jean and tell him that I do also do not have a father, and that I will be his pen pal. Except, well, I'm out of time. Raleigh trapped me and said if I do not help him get his secret stash, he will tell the police that Mother helped kill Mimi Ming. I think people want to destroy Canada, and then Mother and me. Please help. Please read. Letters from Johnny. Your friend, Johnny. With hope, so will be tomorrow to face that. Kick in the traces. Showing you places. Toronto. That's people city. when you show it off to a bunch of kids in school who are like the most demanding audience when it comes to short videos because that's all they do every day and they actually liked it and they said they wanted to read the book so I knew it worked oh. and to me it oozes sideburns bell bottoms and it just you can smell the dusty vinyl in that so anyway sometimes there is genius in what appears to be simple case in point is this cover there's stories both inside and on it. I want to start with the inside, the very first story, and that's the dedication. It goes to my grandfather. He arrived in Canada in 1911 and would suffer a fatal heart attack on Henry Street, where much of the novel and my family history takes place. Everything on the inside and on the outside is because of him. Three generations later, my 14-year-old nephew Avery would illustrate this cover. It's very meaningful to have had family involved. And that, of course, includes my wife, Trish, whose original concept for this cover um, made it all happen. So um, Avery nails this cover because it bleeds blue. Toronto Maple Leafs blue. Now, if you judged this by its sharp simplicity alone, you might miss many nuances. You'd be mistaken to think that this is just the YA read. But patience rewards the keen eye and the, and the careful reader. Just like the pages within, there's a lot going on. That's my cue for a costume change. <laughs> <clears throat> just have to show that off for a sec. So the leaf jersey in here is a retro version. Number 14 is Dave Keons. He's a leaf legend, as many of you would know. However, if you walk into most classrooms nowadays, at least within the Catholic school board where I work in Ottawa as a social worker, you're not likely to see a chalkboard in use. 
if you see a student writing, it's often into a Chromebook. So that's a bit, bit of a giveaway. This is not in the here and now. And if you look closely, you'll see Johnny's writing a letter to Mr. Keon, which I actually did as a kid. And if, and if that wasn't enough, there's a real concrete clue on the chalkboard that gives historical context as to what's going on. It says October 17, 1970. It's the day after Pierre Trudeau enacted the War Measures Act, sending soldiers into the streets of Montreal and Ottawa, who, along with the police, arrested 500 people. And it's the day Quebec Cabinet Minister Pierre Laporte's body was found in the trunk of a car strangled by his captors. The FLQ crisis just went nuclear. It's all in here through the eyes of a boy in a community and a country, all trying to make sense of change, all trying to find themselves, all searching for solid ground. So Letters from Johnny is a fictionalized tale drawn from the characters and the neighborhood of my childhood on Henry Street. Like Johnny, I roamed and I wandered. Those of you who know me might say, I'm still doing that, but my territory is now global. Henry Street was made up of small, low-income starter homes and rooming houses years away from gentrification. As in the novel, I had a hippy-dippy teacher in love with Pierre Trudeau. There were draft dodgers partying down the street. There was an obsessive immigrant gardener. There was the creepy cat woman uh, who lived a few doors away. I scrapped with bullies, losing almost all of them. Um, they were all there as was my love for Dave Keon. And of course, the bombings and the ki kidnappings in the background. So this is a coming of age story, but not only for Johnny, but of a community and the country. Getting back to the richness of the cover, your first impression might be that it appears to be a simple story. It's not that thick, really it's only about 125 pages. However, looks are deceptive. Beneath the cover, we see bullying, we see racism, we see a murder, betrayal, kidnapping, another murder, and a family and a country falling apart. By the end, no one is as they initially appeared to be. You'll laugh along the way and you'll see that the draft dodger was more than a draft dodger. The bully, like most bullies, he has his own story. Johnny's family is more than he thought they were. The cat woman, Let's just say she was more than a cat lover. Johnny's still a boy, but he's evolving, and his world suddenly got bigger. The one constant is Dave Keon, who speaks no lines, but looms large. Even today, he remains almost mythical to many, reminding us of when the times were really good and heroes remained standing. We were all 11, but what would have happened if huge events what will we have done had huge events happened, either within or outside our bubble? What if they had disrupted our world? Whether you're a child or an adult, how we react to the uncertainty determines our resilience. And so it's true whether it's today, in the middle of a pandemic, or 50 years ago during a family, community, or national crisis. For a child with limited means, sometimes all we can do is write. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Wayne, so much. You're just the way that uh, hearing you speak, I think of how we've heard that intelligent people can understand complex things, but genius is taking complexity and making it so that anyone can understand. And you definitely do that with all of these threads and all this history and, and, and putting it into a book that can be read by any age. Thank you so much. So next up, we have our poetry for today. So our first book of poetry, South China Sea, was written by Ken Norris. Born in New York City in 